Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's event, Top 5 Reasons to Join Grespin 2023 APAC. My name is Trey Archer, and I'm the Business Development Director for GRESP here in Asia, and we're very excited to have you join us for this very informative session today. So we imagine everybody attending today's webinar is in the same boat. Many of you have probably spoken with your investors about doing GRESP or seeing your industry peers talk about their GRESP performance on social media, and I've probably had conversations with myself and other GRESP representatives on the call today about signing up for the benchmark. And with the portal just opening on April 1st of this year and closing in just under three months on July 1st, we understand that the decision to join a global benchmark is an important one. So we want you to feel supported and confident about your decision. And that's why we're here to support you on your ESG journey. So our agenda today is fairly straightforward and divided into two parts. The first part consists of five sessions which is intended to bust a few myths regarding GRESP participation and address some common questions that cause hesitancy in signing up to GRESP as a first timer. So the first topic today, it's about starting your journey and this will be led by GRESP's head of Asia Pacific, Ruben Lambrook. Next up, the bar isn't high as you may think, presented by GRESP's Asia lead representative, Yvonne Huang. Following that, our sales manager for infrastructure, Karthik Jagajivan, will touch on the topic of there is limited downside. Next, we will have Pooja Changani, member relations manager APAC, to talk about how our support resources are plentiful. Then we will circle back to Ruben for the last topic of today's webinar. Your organization will be better off. In the second and final part of today's presentation, we will have a live Q&A session. Some of you have already pre-submitted questions, which is great, and we'll try to get to all of these today. But if you have any other questions along the way, please be sure to write them in the chat box, and we will get to these during the final session. Remember, all questions are good questions. So the ultimate reason any company joins GRESP is to be part of the premier global ESG benchmark for real assets which will allow you to improve your ESG strategy and standardize alignment year after year after year. As some of you know, we started back in 2009 by a group of institutional investors looking to get more transparency into the sustainability impacts of their real estate investments. But over time, we grew enormously to encompass nearly 2,000 participants with over 150,000 assets from across 74 countries reporting to GRESP in 2022. In 2016, we introduced our infrastructure benchmark, and since then, we have expanded to over 800 funds and assets from across 35 sectors and 70 countries. As you can see, thousands of your peers are already doing GRESP, reaping the benefits of attracting investments from our 170-plus investment members, receiving lower cost of capital from banks in the form of SLLs, sustainability linked loans, and doing their part in creating a more sustainable future for us and our future generations. However, in the past, all of these participants were just like you, sitting on the fence and making the decision to jump in and get going. And that's totally normal and understandable, but that's why we're here today. So that said, let's kick things off and I'll pass the mic down under to our head of Asia Pacific, Ruben Lambrook. Ruben, over to you. Um, indeed, my name is Ruben Langbroek and I'm based out of Sydney, Australia, so down under. Um, and I'm head of Asia Pacific for GRASP. Um, I've been with the organization for a long time, so I've heard many questions uh, regarding potential participation, the benefits, the doubts, etc. We've heard and seen it all. So as Trey mentioned, hopefully today we can uh, uh, crack some of the, uh, some of the long-standing myths regarding GRASP participation. It'll also provide you with a bit more insights into the actual benefits of, uh, of participation. Uh, and so here we are um, together to present you with, let's say, five main reasons to do GRASP today, or at least in 2023. Uh, and I would like to start with the first one, which is that it's really about the start of your journey, or perhaps your, your green journey. Um, we know that with GRASP participation, um, you know, there's a whole process involved regarding 
uh, collecting ESG data, reporting it to our platform, uh, and then of course receiving your first year GRASP score and rating and uh, peer comparisons. Uh, but it's not just about that. It's not about your score and your rating, even though it forms, of course, a very important part of your quest participation. Um, actually, what it's about, it's about being able to start your journey uh, by setting a baseline in terms of what are your current ESG practices and processes, and to what extent do these align with what is considered by the investment industry best practice. Um, so the GRASP assessment and the standards uh, on which the assessments are based uh, really give you a few to see, you know, what are you doing in terms of ESG practices, policies, processes, actions within your organization, and of course, uh, downstream to the portfolio and assets that you manage, uh, but also to compare yourself with your peers and see what they're doing and then learning from what your peers are doing in terms of best practices or common practices and adopting those to allow you to do better. Uh, so it's really about how you perform. And uh, if we look at the next slide, um, it's also very, um, we, we've shown and, and we've seen that it's, it's, it's working. This annual uh, benchmark that really drives participation first and foremost to understand what you're doing. But importantly, um, it allows every participant that starts for the first time to understand where they, they are and then to learn from what their peers are doing and do better. So what you can see in this slide is the cohort of first year participants every year. And it indeed shows that each of them are structurally able to improve their ESG performance year after year. But of course, it starts by jumping on board of the, the grass train first. Uh, and also what I like about this graph is not just that you know, there's an increase in performance on the ESG. But also, which is very core to our mission, where we are able to uh, convey and share best practices from the leaders back to the rest of the industry, it allows everyone to adopt these practices and um, actually start at an increasingly higher level. And that's what uh, this is shown in the, um, in the graph as well. So, um, yeah, I would say it's really about starting your journey. Um, come on board. Uh, we'll lead you along the way. There's a very clear roadmap uh, and navigation towards becoming a grass leader. Um, but yeah, so don't don't get um, over anxious about your first year uh, grasp score and rating. I think that that's core to our message there. Um, I think now it's time to uh, bust our first myth. Um, so if we hear like, oh, if we score poorly the first year, you know, we have to explain it to our stakeholders and specifically uh, our investors that are grass members. Uh, but yeah, we are. We fear that they might not want to talk to us because you know, we did a poor job. Uh, we cannot emphasize enough that that's not how it works. It's not the reality. Um, investors really appreciate the fact that you have started your green journey by disclosing your practices and policies in line with the GRASP uh, framework, which investors see as, I say, the golden standard for ESG benchmarking in real assets. It shows that you, know, you started your journey. It shows that alongside a, a structural process, you are collecting material ESG data and metrics and are able to report it to them. So they can make better informed decisions regarding their engagement. And, and, they, would, and they look forward to engaging with you on your quest results. So um, yeah, I would say don't be too anxious about your first few results and how GRASP investor members or your investors would interpret those. They really value the fact that you are able to disclose what you're doing, and then, of course, to set your uh, improvement programs. Um, this is also shown in the, in the next slide where we have questions our investor member um, regarding how they engage with their investment managers uh, and how they use GRASP. Uh, and the vast majority said that they either uh, encourage or actually request participation from their investment managers. And you can see it's now almost 50-50. So we've seen an increase in grass participation becoming a requirement from investors. Uh, we expect that to, to be a trend going forward as well. But again, interestingly, um, of all grass investor members that we surveyed, only 15% indicated that they set performance improvement targets. So within the ones that actively reach out, that's about uh, 20%. So it shows that indeed they value transparency above scores and disclosures above your ranking. And that's, that's really the, the, the message that they are trying to send 
So again, don't be too fearful of, uh, let's say, tough questions from your investor members. They understand that this is the start of your journey. And they actually they really appreciate the fact that you started it by using the Grasp assessment. Um, I think that's all for reason and myth number one. I would like uh, to hand over to my colleague, Yvonne, to move over to reason number two. Up to you, Yvonne. Sure. Thank you, Ruben. Hi, everyone. Great to have you in the room here. My name is Yvonne Huang, and I'm the lead representative of Grasp in Asia. Formerly from Capital Land, I have a passion for buildings and people and how we interact with our built environment. So as you know, no buildings are alike, just like everyone is unique. So let me use the analogy of a health checkup uh, for sort of why you should join grass assessment this year. Um, you know, everyone should go on annual checkup so you know your BMI, cardio, visceral fat, and so on, and the areas you should prioritize in your own health journey. Same with grass. So grass is just like your comprehensive ESG health checkup for your portfolio. And, you know, there is a myth that if your uh, portfolio or your client joining this year stepping on the weighing scale, uh, their ESG health checkup may not look so good. To be honest, you might be pleasantly surprised. So here's the myth we want to bust. Reason number two, the bar is not as high as you might think. Next slide, please, Puja, thank you. So um, as you can see here on the top part of the chart, the average lending, um, so the perfect score is 100. So 100 means you're a net zero building, you know, pink of health. And most people are not there. The average lending um, in the first year participant, it ranges between 11 to 65, as you can see there. And the 100 points comes from 30% coming from your management score, which is how you set out your ESG policy, your ESG strategy, and so on. And the 70% uh, comes from your building performance score. So that's the quantitative part, a lot of data to be collected and evidence to be uploaded. And if you have project that's not being built yet is still under construction, you can also apply. You just submit your development uh, scores in that 70%. So as you can see here um, in the management score, the average score is actually 22 out of 30. So that should be pretty straightforward for any organization to be able to fill that out. Uh, next slide, please, Puja. Thank you. So as you can see here, um, you know, we all have a bit of anxiety before stepping on weighing scale, right? We are not exactly models. And uh, you might think, oh, my portfolio will be compared to, you know, prime office location or, uh, you know, five-star grass participants. And it's totally not true. The reality is, uh, let's look at the bullet point number one. Grass is for all types of organizations and portfolio. So we do not um, compare, say, someone's health checkup result for a 50-year-old to a 20-year-old because that will be pointless. And uh, you can say, yeah, but I'm triple net lease. Uh, my situation is different. And, you know, this is where Grass can really look at case, to, uh, case by case. You can look at the second point that we typically compare like for likes. And the last bullet point, how investors using our data, they're very aware of different property types. So if you're in logistics assets, the energy use won't be 24 seven like hospitals and hotels. So we do not, we do compare sector data differently. So I hope with this um, assurance and this myth busted, before I hand over the mic to my colleague Kartik, I just want to encourage you to stay up on the weighing scale to start your ESG health checkup this year. Thank you. Over to you, Kartik. The floor is yours. Thank you, Yvonne. 
Yvonne has been instrumental in getting the grass voice out to high growth economies in Greater China as our lead representative. Now, even though personally I focus on the Asian infrastructure sector here at GRASP as a regional sales manager, the questions that I often get asked about GRASP is synonymous across all real assets. So with that, on to reason three, there is limited downside to doing GRASP. Now that you've taken the first step in benchmarking your real assets, what next? You have a three-month submission window to work with for the assessments. So in addition to the excellent support provided to you by our member relations team, GRASP additionally offers three participant programs. The first is the grace period. Your score and details are not revealed. Now, this can be simply described as, in the Asian context, a preliminary examination of sorts. This is exclusively available for first-year participants where your GRASP score at the end of the assessment window can only be viewed by you and the assessing body. In this case, GRASP. No one else, not even our investor members. I often recommend first-year participants to opt into the grace period so that they can track their progress aligned with their internal ESG strategy and roadmap. There's no additional fee involved in opting in. The second participant program that we offer is the response check. The purpose of the response check through our third-party validator SRI based in the US is really to offer clarifications on A, am I answering the question? B, is the data that I'm providing in support of my answer specifically what is required by the question? And C, are my answers to the questions comprehensive enough to get me the full marks attributable? Last but not least, the results review. Now this typically takes place in September of the assessment timeline, which is, as you know, has begun, where you can schedule for an additional fee, an extensive review of the GRASP benchmark report. It will also guide you on interpreting and communicating your results to others, in addition to areas for improvement on certain ESG indicators. With that, let's go on to the next slide where I'm going to bust a myth. So if my organization participates in ops into the grace period, investors will still ask to see our GRASS score. The reality is as such, what investors really want, and this comes from GRASP's network of over 170 institutional investors with over 50 trillion US dollars of assets under management, is for organizations to take the first step in collecting, quantifying, and disclosing material ESG data. What investors also desire is to see organizations taking part in GRASP as the first step, with the first year being the practice run. In fact, several investors have made it part of their investment mandate to only engage companies that have taken part in GRASP and have a GRASP score. They are fully aware that the first year is really, as I've mentioned, a practice run for organizations. And as I've mentioned earlier, Opting into the grace period is really an opportunity to learn the language of ESG and start entrenching yourself in the ecosystem. Now, what is especially attractive to investors is to see organizations actually progressing in terms of ESG over a multi-year commitment, having considered what would be deemed material ESG factors over a forward-looking time horizon with improvements annually. And grace really is the first step in helping organizations achieve that. And as an ending note, before I hand the baton over to Pooja, is that the fact that you're already joining us today tells me that you know you want to do GRASP. What you want is to take a decision based, on, based more on the matter of timing, that is to say, which assets you would like to start with. With that, over to you, Pooja. Thank you, Karthik. And thank you all for joining us today. As Karthik mentioned, we appreciate that you've taken the first step uh, to represent and demonstrate your interest in particip participating with GRASP. Now, we understand as a first-time participant member, it can seem very daunting and very challenging to get involved in yet another reporting process that's involved. With that, that brings me over to reason number four, and that is that the support resources at GRASP are plentiful. 
At GRASP, we have a number of resources and support systems in order to help you with the reporting process. To begin with, we have an extremely comprehensive reference guide and GRASP standard documentation, which breaks down each question like an open book exam, where you can specifically look into the intent and the rationale and the reasoning in which we have each of these questions. It also breaks it down by listing out the type of evidence that would actually be required in order to score full marks, which is addressed by the GRASP scoring document. So in essence, it also helps you understand ways in which you can um, shape your ESG or sustainability um, and, and drive it forward in a way in which it would matter with what the industry is ideally looking for. In addition to this, we also have an online training platform, which is catered to both real estate and infrastructure, which represents a series of short videos that goes over the different elements of the reporting framework and the process that you would be answering throughout that assessment process. In Amsterdam, we have at our headquarters, we have a, a very enthusiastic team of member success representatives who can help out with any questions or any technical um, concerns you may have with regards to the assessment or with regards to the way in which, um, you know, the GRASP uh, assessment will, will lead out your results. And that's something that will be will they're very efficient and they're able to revert back to you in a very short period of, of time so that's something that would be very advantageous and it's a huge support system to be able to have that on board as well in addition to this we also have a series of webinars and we have a grasp insights page where we have a number of articles case studies, as well as historical webinars, which represent some thought leadership articles that have taken place, as well as some insights into best practices in how organizations can drive sustainability and ESG forward. Last but not least, we have a partner directory. So if I just move over to the next slide, you'll be able to see a number of partners that we work with across the region. With our partners, they receive regular training and support, as well as partner focus calls where they're up to date with the changes that GRESP has had, and they're very familiar with the content on the ground. As you can see on this page across the APAC region, we have a number of partners focused on real estate and infrastructure, where they have a very specific deep dive into local countries and regions as well to really give you that on the ground support that you may need in a particular region or a particular country. Moving on to the myth that we would like to bust for today is doing GRASP is too time consuming or it's too resource intensive. We understand that, you know, there are all these fears that um, participating in GRASP would require a lot of time, a lot of support, a lot of your resources. But to be honest, with all the resources that you have across and all the support that you have with GRASP, this just really eliminates and alleviates that reporting burden that you may be worried about or you may be concerned about. In fact, by participating with GRASP, it really helps you with integrating GRASP into your existing reporting processes, and it helps with streamlining your, your ESG reporting efforts. After the first year of GRASP reporting, the majority of indicators would actually be pre-filled into your assessment processes. So it alleviates, again, that additional reporting fear that you may have that, okay, if I do this in the first year, I need to refill everything for the second year. But actually, the first years of reporting may seem the most challenging, but every year after that becomes so much easier because we have this pre-filling function, which saves a lot of time on your end as well. Last but not least, it really allows you to establish a baseline for your ESG performance and set goals for improvement, which in return can lead to long-term cost-saving benefits. As we know, we can never improve what we don't measure, and by participating in GRASP, you're able to identify areas in which you can really do better and really improve your overall ESG performance. With that, and with, with further ado, I, I would like to pass it over back to Ruben, who will go over the fifth reason. Awesome. Thank you, Pooja. So reason number five, the last already, um, your organization will be better off. Uh, indeed, it is our mission, as we said, to provide our members or different stakeholders with actionable insights so everyone can do better. And that's exactly what participation in this year's GRASP assessments will allow you to do. Um, as I mentioned before, it gives you insights in terms of what your peers are doing, but also how you can align with global best practices in the ESG, and then of course, take actions accordingly. Um, it's not just an assessment or let's say a scorecard, but also can be used as a framework that can inform your own ESG strategies, policies, and processes. 
So often we hear like, oh, we're still working on our ESG strategies or we're not ready for grasp yet. Actually, it could be the other way around. In the absence of such strategies, determine your baseline, see where the biggest gaps are in terms of you know, what your peers are doing or what is considered to be best practice, and then incorporate those learnings back into your, into your strategies. Uh, we've seen that typically you know, those kind of approaches will indeed lead to better managed assets, uh, uh, better organizations, and of course, happier stakeholders. Um, and perhaps last, because GRASP is considered to be the, go the golden standard of ESG within the real asset investment sector, um, it really helps you expand your exposure to uh, investors globally. Uh, to give an indication, nowadays we have about 200 investor members that subscribe to our data, uh, representing over 60 trillion US dollar in institutional capital that is seeking green investments in either real estate or infrastructure, portfolios and assets. So uh, we've seen the graph before, uh, the vast majority is actually reaching out to their investment managers and either encouraging or requiring best participation. So again, participation really allows you to open, um, let's say, open your exposure to a large number of institutional and some real estate investors, both equity and debt providers around the globe. Um, so I would say, yeah, participation is a win-win-win, as we've heard from uh, other colleagues as well. So perhaps time to bust our last myth of today, which is... So we often hear that there is no tangible benefit beyond getting a GRASP score and rating. Uh, obviously, totally not true. Uh, ESG practices can definitely enhance your organization's and portfolio's resi resilience, but also allow you to incorporate better risk identification, management and mitigation processes at the same time. Uh, think of, especially in light of climate change, uh, reputational risk, physical risk, as well as transition risk. But also, again, looking at best practices in terms of how those risks are being managed and mitigated uh, by your peers. And typically, this will result in increased stakeholder confidence that you are adhering to best practices and doing the right thing for your stakeholders, including your investors. Uh, but even then, to be honest, you know, one of the most asked questions that we all receive is uh, when we try to uh, convey the benefits of GRASP is like, yeah, yeah, sure, we want to be green. and we might consider participation, but bottom line, what's in it for us? Which is a great question. I mean, as investment managers, investing on behalf of your investors, that's a question that you always need to ask. Like, you know, what, what's in it? What, what's the impact on your, either your, your financial risk or your financial returns? Um, I think it's safe to say that by now there's a large body of evidence that shows that there is a positive correlation between financial performance on one hand and ESG performance on the other. And um, that includes a number of studies that were done that use GRASP data, for which the recent, most recent one is, uh, is shown here, applicable at least to the Asia-Pacific region. That indeed shows that non-listed real estate funds on average had a uh, quite a strong uptick in, um, in returns uh, linked to their increase in GRASP performance year on year. Um, I always say correlation is not the same as causation, so one does not necessarily need to lead to another, but at least it shows that doing well and doing good can go hand in hand. Uh, and then last, uh, as Trey already mentioned in the intro, we've seen that the GRASP results and data are used for an increasing number of different use cases, including sustainable finance, so indeed sustainability linked loan, where the GRASP performance in terms of score and future scores is linked to performance improvement targets. So in sustainability linked loans where the um, borrower, the issuer, the, the company reports to us and the lender, typically the bank, agree on certain improvement targets, GRASP forms as a great uh, framework to independently measure if those targets are being met and to monitor progress towards those targets on an annual basis. So um, I think hereby our last myth has been busted as well. Um, there's definitely more in it than just getting your crash rating and score. So again, jump on the crash train and uh, and let's go in. I think now it's time to go back for uh, our Q and A session um, to go back to Trey. Trey, over to you. 
Thank you very much, Ruben. And also thank you, Yvonne, Karthik, and Pooja. Uh, I, I personally found it very interesting, even though I'm already aware of all of these busted myths. So thank you. Are you going to now? Did we go you? <laughs> we, we will soon see. <laughs> okay. Um, so that being said, um, we, we are coming into the, the second part of today's session, which is the Q&A. Um, so when you signed up, you did have the option to pre-submit a question. We actually have a few questions uh, that were pre-submitted. So we'll go ahead and start with those. Um, in the meantime, it's still not too late to ask any questions. So while we're covering some of these, feel free to go into the chat box, um, write the question, and then we'll be able to um, uh, cover that here in the second part of today's conversation. So the first um, pre-submitted question that we have says, we are an entity with diversified assets, standalone and development investment. Uh, and upon registration, do we register ourselves as one participating portfolio or to register our assets individually as participating assets? So this is a very good question. Um, basically, it depends if you're on the infrastructure side or real estate side. So that being said, uh, let's have our infrastructure expert, Karthik, touch on this a bit more. Um, Karthik, do you want to explain the difference um, between participating assets and portfolio level and how they're different between the infrastructure and real estate side? Certainly. Thanks, Ray. And I think all about this question is it's best to dissect this question in several stages, but let's just hone in on the infrastructure side of things. So in comparison to the real estate assessment at GRESP, infrastructure assessments have two types of assessments. One is the fund level and one is the asset level. Now, if, you have, if, if you're a manager or an asset operator of a single infrastructure asset, go ahead, do the infrastructure asset assessment that allows you to compare like for like, compare, to give you a like for like comparison with another asset uh, from a different peer. So you would have a peer benchmark for that particular asset. Now, if you have a portfolio, it's still typically recommended as a first year participant for infrastructure assets to take part in the infrastructure asset assessment because an aggregated com uh, score will form the, uh, a part of the, the, the component, the performance component that's required for infrastructure fund assessment or rather portfolio assessment. Now, the interesting thing um, about the fund assessment is that as I've mentioned, it draws upon the scoring of the operational asset which form the performance component for your infra individual infrastructure assets. So it makes more sense to really start with the infrastructure asset portfolio itself. Now that again, the question really hones in on answering the infrastructure aspect of um, um, the, the overall question. But what I also like to draw um, address here is that there are core differences between infrastructure and real estate. Now infrastructure assessments uh, as I've mentioned, there are two types of uh, infrastructure assessments. One is the fund level, i.e. the portfolio, and one is the asset. Now, where it really differs with real estate assessments is that infrastructure looks at operational, currently operational assets. And that's important to take note because that's where we look at a different component which, uh, un which underpins the assessment for infrastructure, which is the performance component. The other aspect to infrastructure assessments is that it really focuses on eight distinct asset classes. And the eight are data infrastructure, energy and water resources, renewables, transport, environmental services and waste management, network utilities, conventional thermal generation, and of course, social infrastructure. So if you have an asset in one of these asset classes and you want to do a like-for-like -like comparison, data centers, for example, it's highly recommended to go with the infrastructure assessment. And the last core difference between the real estate assessment and the infrastructure side is that infrastructure assessments utilize a materiality-based materiality scoring. A materiality assessment is typically recommended prior to doing an infrastructure asset assessment because that allows you to identify which are the material ESG factors for your particular asset based on intrinsic characteristics such as the sector the, the location, the, the regional context, and also whether it's privately or publicly held. Now that really answers the infrastructure side of things. I'll, I'll hand it over to Trey to touch a bit about the real estate side. 
Yeah, certainly. Thank you, Karthik. And I actually think this is tied to another question that we received during the presentation um, that simply asked, what's the difference between gross real estate and infrastructure? So let's, um, I think we can hit two birds with one stone for this one. Um, so Karthik already did a great job of explaining the different, I, I think he said the seven or eight different sectors that we cover for infrastructure. Um, and a little bit about how um, the materiality is different between the, um, um, the real estate assessment and infrastructure one. But if we're looking at reporting for real estate, it's a bit more straightforward. Um, so where in infrastructure, you have the option to report on a fund uh, or on an individual assets. In real estate, it's a bit different. We report on the entity level or the fund level or what we like to say aggress the investable vehicle. Um, so that wouldn't be necessarily registering each individual asset to participate. It would be registering your fund or your REIT or your private fund uh, to report to GRESS. And all of those underlying assets that fall under that fund or that vehicle, you'll, of course, report on the data for those assets. But that will all be aggregated into the fund level. And that's what we, you will see on your final GRESS assessment. So there is a bit of a nuance there. Um, and I hope that answers your question. And I host, also hope it explains uh, or answers a bit more on the second question that we have of what's the difference between the real estate assessment and infrastructure one as well, where infrastructure covers those seven or eight core sectors, while real estate is mostly looking at uh, residential office buildings, operational assets, um, developmental assets as well, et cetera. Great. So question number two um, states, how does the scoring and rating determine where we stand in our ESG performance? Um, so this is a very interesting question. Um, I'll, I'll just go ahead and briefly touch on this uh, very quickly. Um, so when you see your GRESP assessment, this is the same on the infrastructure assessment or the real estate one. You'll see that the, the first scores you see, there are three. You have your total global score, which is one out of 100, 100 being the highest. Um, then you also have your GRESP star rating, which the lowest star any entity or fund or company can get is one green star and the highest is five. So based on your total score, one out of 100, if your total score is in the top 20th percentile, then you will get five green stars. If your total score is in the top 40th percentile globally, you get four green stars. In the top 60%, three green stars, et cetera, et cetera. Then the last score or rating um, that we have in GRESP is your peer benchmark group. Um, so your peer benchmark group is looking at um, similar companies or funds that are in a similar geographical region, a similar listed or non-listed status, and also similar asset class. So once we have at least a minimum of six entities that fall into a similar grouping based off of that three criteria, we'll put them into a peer benchmark group and then from there, we'll take whoever has the highest global total score will be ranked first in that peer benchmark group. The second high score will be ranked second, et cetera, et cetera. So when you ask how does scoring and rating determine where we stand in our ESG performance, there's really three main um, different ratings or indicators that we have in GRESP that will show how you stand overall in ESG uh, right off the back on the first page of your assessment. If you want to break it down just a bit more as well on the real estate side, on the performance um, and the performance component, um, or, or and sorry, in the standing uh, investment benchmark, we can see that E, the environmental side, is around 60% of your total score, while S and G are both around 20% of your total score. And then on the development side, it's around 50% is on the E, while uh, the remaining um, S and G both constitute as around 25%, 25% for your total score. Great, so I hope that answers your question. Um, we do have another one. <clears throat> um, and this one states, um, well, a compliment, uh, great stats on the correlation of fund returns and GRESS score improvements. So um, thank you very much. Um, and the question is, what study is uh, in US 2021? Um, so Ruben, I think we, just got done speaking about this. Um, so I'll pass this over to you if you just want to provide a bit more insight on some of those um, case studies. Yeah, we can definitely share um, uh, the studies that have used GRESP data before. So um, I think the first couple of studies, they're at least half a decade old, um, that looked both at non-listed property funds in Europe 
another one at Listed Reads Globally, which was done um, by an uh, academic institution in the US. Uh, and both indeed showed the positive correlation already back then. Obviously, nowadays we have a much longer track record and many more data points because we have increased our coverage of the real asset industries. Um, and it's great to see that that positive correlation still exists. This uh, particular study was done by university in Singapore and uh, only focused on non-listed property funds um, globally as well. And uh, I think the slide mentioned uh, for any uh, 10 points increase in the GRASP score, uh, that correlated with a 0.85% increase in return. So uh, again, uh, it's difficult to uh, provide evidence for causation, but at least there's a, a quite a strong correlation. Uh, and if there's interest, we can definitely share some of those, um, some of those studies, the most recent one and the past ones uh, to attendees um, today. Great, thank you very much, Ruben. Oh, we also have um, a few, um, I just got notification that we have about four more minutes left. So we do have um, a few other questions that we'll try to get to. Um, so we'll try to run through these relatively quickly and get through as many of the pre-submitted questions as possible. Um, so one question it states, if I am participating as a listed entity, can I just share my score with some investors as opposed to all while being on the grace period? Um, so that's an interesting question. Um, and we'll pass that over to Pooja to provide more information on that. So Pooja, I want to touch on the grace period a bit more. Yeah, uh, thank you for that question. Um, so as Karthik had, had explained, the grace period works in a way in which to sort of protect yourself um, in the first year of participating. We understand that in the first year, you're sort of getting familiar with the grass submission process. You're getting familiar with the type of questions that are being asked and how our third party validator SRI actually um, scores and uh, provides that overall overall score with the data that you're providing. So essentially the grace period is applies to all first year participant members and it's an option where you can choose to exercise it where your scores will remain confidential for the first the first year scores will remain confidential then but even in every future year of your report the first year score will always be hidden so not no members no investor members will ever be able to see that on the second part of the question addressing the listed entity so we have investor members who are able to request and look at your data so if you are a listed entity you have we have real estate and infrastructure listed members and we have real estate and infrastructure non-listed investor members where they can have access to these respective data sets now if you are a listed entity and we have a investor member that subscribes to the listed data sets after the first year. So after um, the, the first year of reporting with the grace period, they can have access to your, with, with, with your scores being on it, they can actually have access to your report, but they can never access anything that has been show, showcased in the first year reporting if you have chosen to exercise that grace period option. I hope that helps clarify. Perhaps to, to add to that, Pooja, uh, so if your first year results look fine, you are still able to uh, lift the grace period if needed. So if you change your mind, say, hey, no, we did great the first year, which you probably will, uh, you have the option to lift the grace period, and then that will allow all uh, your investors to actually access your results uh, by the portal. So that option always is available as well. Right. Thank you so much. Um, I think we have um, just time for one more question. Um, so we just had another question come in and I think this will be the last one of the day. So we might go just a minute or two over. Um, but this question states, um, hello, I would like to ask about the rise in occupancy and consumption after the post COVID, um, the, the, the post COVID situation will affect our GRESS score. Um, so thank you very much for that question. Um, and I think, Yvonne, uh, we haven't heard from you, so we will go ahead and pass this question to you. Um, any insight on that, Yvonne? Sure. So um, according to our 2022 uh, assessment surveys, so globally, 
disappointingly, post -co there is co post COVID bounce back for everyone. However, the bounce back is not significant, showing a lot of companies have been doing a lot to mitigate uh, that energy use or water use increment as well. So again, because it's a huge database and we only focus on real estate and only infrastructure. So the stability of the data is quite stable and that's why investors uh, like the transparency of our data. Um, I hope that answers your question, George. Uh, happy to um, discuss further after this forum. Yeah, I think that's it's quite a complicated question that that we could probably go into for um, uh, many minutes. But unfortunately, with the with, with uh, already going over time, um, we can keep it simple with with that uh, explanation from Yvonne. Um, so thank you very much, Yvonne, for for addressing that. Um, and Yvonne also brings a good point. Um, look, we only have limited time today, but I'm sure there are other thoughts and questions or any other comments you have. Uh, feel free to reach out to your um, your GRESS representative who you've been speaking with, and we'd be happy to um, touch on any other questions that you have to assist you in your reporting journey this year. So that's it from all of us. Uh, we'd like to thank you all for joining today, um, and I hope, which was a very insightful session, um, and also this myth-busting session to be able to um, really prepare you for your 2023 CRESP infrastructure or real estate assessment. Thank you very much and best of luck to you.